Hi, Ellie. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you for having me. You know, they gave you a little bit of an intro, but I'd like to tell the audience more about your background, if that's okay. Sure. Congressman Khanna was elected in 2016 after serving as a tech liaison to the Obama administration, which means it's not a surprise that he's focused on technology issues during his time in Washington. This year, he's introduced a bill that would require cybersecurity risk training for all federal employees. He was, in fact, the only freshman Democrat to have a bill signed into law last Congress, is that right? Few others, but we had two bills. Signed. Two bills, right. And one allows veterans on the GI Bill to take tech accredited courses, and the other requires government websites to modernize like private ones, meaning if anyone here has actually paid for DMV services online with a credit or debit card rather than finding a stamp, finding an envelope, writing a check, and sending it in, you can thank Congressman Khan after this talk. Uh, but right now, you have recently written the Internet Bill of Rights and are focused on adding a blockchain section to that. We have a lot to be grateful for to have a Congress member with a tech background coming from Silicon Valley, the heart of the tech industry in Washington, D.C., representing our interests. So we're really grateful to have you here today. Well, thank you, Ellie, and thank you for all of your advocacy as a, a leader of the Blockchain Association, as being such a voice respected, not just in the state, but in the federal government and showing that you can lead on technology as a public official. Thank you. I'd like to start by asking you sort of what is the state of blockchain in Washington, D.C.? Do your fellow policymakers have a sense of the confusion in the industry caused by contrasting definitions of virtual currencies, by jurisdictional overlaps? Do they know that there's an exodus of the blockchain industry overseas? Well, to be honest with you, I don't know how many members of Congress really know what blockchain is. I mean, they yeah. uh, may have heard of Bitcoin or Libra, but they probably wouldn't be able to tell you much about what a dis digital distributed ledger does or why we need transactions between people to people or the applications of blockchain, not just in currency, but in supply chain management or medical records. And there is not nearly enough literacy about the power of blockchain. In a sense, you know, to me, blockchain represents a move against the concentration of wealth and the increase of power of institutions. What blockchain is saying is we need to decentralize. We need to allow people-to-people -people interaction. So Washington should be open to that, given the concerns about the concentration of wealth. But I just don't think the technology is well enough understood. And certainly that it's not understood uh, how much of a risk uh, we have in losing out to China, uh, where China is promoting this technology in a, in a huge way, uh, and we are not doing nearly uh, enough. So uh, I've started with some others, the Blockchain Caucus, We've called uh, for the Blockchain Promotion Act, which I support to uh, have the Department of Commerce come up with a strategy to make sure the blockchain industry develops here. We've called for greater clarity in regulation between the CFTC and SEC. Uh, but these are things that we, we need to work on. Right. So there are a couple bills. You mentioned one, the Blockchain Promotion Act. There's also the Token Taxonomy Act of 2018, now 2019. We've even heard some verbal calls on the House floor to ban all cryptocurrency. What can the industry reali realistically expect from Congress in the next legislative cycle? Well, anyone trying to predict what Congress is going to do on any issue uh, is probably going to get into trouble and not be accurate. But what I will say what we should aspire to do is have smart, thoughtful regulation that's transparent. I mean, no one believes that it should be the Wild West. Obviously, you need SINFEN, which is part of the Department of Treasury, to make sure that there's not money laundering. Yeah. Obviously, you need to make sure that the FBI and Justice Department is regulating uh, blockchain or the internet in general to make sure that there's not child pornography. Uh, we need clarity on where the tax uh, is going to be, and I think the IRS has taken a constructive step uh, towards that. And no one is saying that we shouldn't have the SEC or CFTC involved in understanding when something is a security in terms of uh, speculation. 
but in still making sure that people can raise money for their companies uh, and that you're not de 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 describing every transaction as a security. And most of the people I've talked to in, uh, or entrepreneurs, they aren't prescribing a particular outcome. What they're saying is we need regulatory certainty. Uh, and the legislation that I'm on with Darren Soto is actually calling for regulatory certainty. We're saying to the CFTC and the SEC, get together, meet with uh, consumer experts, meet with uh, uh, industry experts, and come up with a regulatory framework. And then we're saying to the Department of Commerce, let's make sure that this industry is here in the United States and not somewhere else. Yeah. You're really getting at what I think the big problem has been, a lack of clarity. And while there's been an absence of federal clarity, some states are taking it into their own hands to create regulatory frameworks. We've seen, I think, 18 different states introduce blockchain legislation, but I want to touch on a really big one, which is Assembly Bill 1489 introduced in California this year. It's been nicknamed, and not flatteringly, California's bit license. Uh, but the language doesn't come from bit license. The language comes from the Uniform Law Commission, which is a group of lawyers who volunteer their time to write model legislation for states on complex regulatory topics. So they decided to tackle virtual currency, and um, this bill as written has some pretty onerous licensing requirements. It would create a whole separate licensing regime for California. Uh, the concern is that it would be expensive and pro time prohibitive to get one, much like the bit license. But the goal is good. The goal is to create a reciprocal licensing system so that you don't have to register with the federal government and individually with all 50 states. It doesn't get us there, though, because it's only been introduced in four states. So right. what do you think of these individual state attempts? I, I support the individual state attempts, especially given that there hasn't been federal leadership, but it's not a substitute for federal leadership. I mean, I don't think anyone in the audience is going to want to go register in 50 different states to be able to uh, do uh, their business or their work. And so I know that the state can help provide legislation that can then become a model, but then we need the federal government to say, okay, here is what the licensing system should be, and let's have a federal system uh, so that you're not stuck in a, in a place where we have 50 different jurisdictions of law. I feel the same about privacy uh, or a number of issues where you do need a uniform federal standard. So ideally, one virtual currency license to rule them all. Yes, and I mean, maybe you have some flexibility with states, uh, but you need some common denominator uh, that the federal government will put, up, put out. Totally agree. Um, I want to talk about another sort of creative state bill. I'm going to shamelessly plug here. The Blockchain Advocacy Coalition introduced Assembly Bill 953 this year. Yeah, you were very involved with it. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we introduced it with Assembly Member Phil Ting from right here in San Francisco. And this bill is an attempt to solve the problem of the unbanked cannabis industry, which sounds like a joke, but it's a serious public safety hazard in California. We created a whole industry with no financial services, so they run entirely in cash. You mentioned the Wild West earlier. We literally use Brinks trucks to collect taxes at a city and state level. It's one step up from a stagecoach with an armed guy in the front of it. We're doing it like it's 1849. And so this is, in my view, an ideal use case for virtual currency, having a real value to the government for a problem they can't solve. It would create standards to use stable coins for cannabis businesses to remit their taxes for state and local governments. What do you think of states getting creative with solutions to federal problems? Well, I congratulate you because I know how much of an advocate you were and, uh, you know, you helped basically write the legislation. I mean, people may not uh, know that here, but you've been uh, uh, really a leader on this. And it's something that I think Congress can sympathize with. Uh, one of the places where I led as a co-sponsor was the Safe Banking Act, which will allow uh, some of the uh, industry to kn know that they can bank and have... Uh, uh, their resources protected if they're in the cannabis industry and not fear that we have an attorney general like we did with Jeff Sessions who could come, come after them. But there's no reason that we should just rely on the Safe Banking Act uh, to protect traditional banking. Uh, this is an area where uh, cryptocurrency can play a role, where uh, people can do uh, business for something that most Americans, most Californians believe is very legitimate, the use of uh, cannabis, uh, and evade uh, the, the, the concerns about unfair or illegal uh, uh, prosecution. And it's important to realize that uh, it's still under the regulatory 
environment. So no one is saying that this is going to enable money laundering or crime. What this is enabling is a legitimate use uh, that uh, some of the federal government has not taken steps to uh, uh, allow. And so I, I'm supportive of it. That's great to hear. And yeah, you're right. We can have full KYC AML compliance while avoiding situations like 10 break-ins in a single month in dispensaries in Sacramento. It ended up with one car driving into a dispensary for a very dramatic smash and grab. Right. Anything we can do to eliminate really problems that are caused by inefficiencies and intermediaries is the goal of blockchain, right? Absolutely. I mean, ultimately, blockchain is about reducing transaction cost. Uh, it's about allowing people to share more things in uh, transactions with each other. So you could have people being able to have transactions in games that they're playing, which weren't allowed. You can have people being able to sell storage from their computer that wasn't allowed. Uh, but the biggest issue I think that we have to understand about blockchain is that it's often open source. That the value that people are creating is not concentrated by in just the hands of one company or a few individuals. It's allowing people around the nation, around the world to contribute. And that open source aspect, that decentralized aspect, in my view, is a counter to the concentration of power in institutions or in large corporations that concern so many folks. I mean, there, it's not coincidental to me that the blockchain movement started or caught, caught greater steam uh, in response to the breakdown of our financial institutions uh, in the Great Recession. People were saying, where are other places can we look? And the Fed coin movement, uh, which is now 40 countries, are talking about the use of blockchain uh, in their own currencies. Well, we don't want the United, if you care about the United States dollar and us remaining the reserve currency, we need to be, continue to be innovative. I mean, no one would say if 40 other countries are using technology that we shouldn't at least consider it. So uh, I think the important thing is to demystify what this technology is to show how many uses it has and then to talk about smart and well-crafted regulation. Absolutely. So we are seeing some very clear regulation in other countries that is causing them to be more competitive with the United States having a large market share for the blockchain industry. Singapore and Switzerland are often referenced as really great frameworks because they differentiate between different types of tokens. Switzerland has asset, utility, and payment tokens. No one's standing in Crypto Valley, scratching their head, wondering if they have a security on their hands or not, and if they're going to get an SEC letter. So how can the US start competing immediately? How can we start bringing the industry back here and growing it here? Well, we should look to other countries that have smart regulatory frameworks to learn from them. But I think, you know, I was just this morning with a lawyer who was, uh, supports a lot of technology companies and uh, invests in some of the companies. And he says, I, I, I don't touch crypto. And I said, why is that? And he said, because of the reg regulatory uncertainty uh, and the concern that people may cross the line because of the uh, uh, non having a clear knowledge. So what we need to say is, let's have a clear regulatory framework. If you disagree with Switzerland or Singapore and you want to make it a stronger framework, fine. I mean, no one is prescribing the outcome. But let's at least work towards a clear outcome so we have a distinction between what's a security and what's a transaction. Uh, and that people have, who are entrepreneurs in this field, know what they're getting into and where the uh, bright lines are. And I have yet to meet an entrepreneur in the Bitcoin space who's saying, don't regulate us or don't regulate money laundering or make, make sure that uh, we just have a totally hands-off process. They all are saying we want smart regulation. They're saying the problem is we don't know what the regulation is. Uh, we don't know if the CFTC is going to be on the same page with the SEC. And then when you talk to those agencies, they'll tell you, well, it's not us. The problem is Congress. We need lawmakers to give us a directive to do this. And that's why I think the Blockchain Promotion Act and Darren Soto's Virtual Currency Act are so important if we can get them passed through Congress. Uh, it directs the SEC and CFTC to do exactly that, to come up with a regulatory framework. If you don't do that, and if you allow these industries to go overseas, I mean, does anyone believe that China is going to have a greater uh, regulatory environment protecting consumers or protecting citizens than uh, laws crafted here? Uh, I don't think so. So if you care about democracy, if you care about consumer protection, you want our country to lead in the regulatory environment. Absolutely. And we've done it before. We did it in the 1990s with the internet. Okay. Our regulators 
got together, they figured it out, series of tubes or whatever they thought it was, they figured out a way to make the internet strong in the United States, in your district in particular, become the global standard for emerging technology and businesses. And so I'm curious what your perspective is. Is there anything different this time? Is it harder? Are there any new barriers we face? I'm genuinely curious. I was in kindergarten the first time. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things we had with the internet is so much of that technology came out of the government, right? right. I mean, so much of DARPA was involved in the creation of uh, the internet and the internet protocols. And blockchain is uh, more organic. I mean, blockchain uh, with Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, we don't even know who it was, uh, who the inventor was. And uh, with Ethereum, uh, again, it's not uh, companies controlling things, it's much more decentralized. And so that has made it harder for uh, governments to get their uh, head around. Uh, but that doesn't excuse the, the lack of a regulatory framework. I mean, we, we have to just work harder to bring the people on board and who are entrepreneurs with the public uh, uh, consumer uh, protection nonprofits and government to, to say, look, we all have the same goals. Let's have a sensible framework. Right. Blockchain is an emerging industry, so they don't have a very big lobbying presence yet in D.C. Even billion-dollar companies are just now opening legislative offices in D.C. I can tell you I'm often the only person at hearings in Sacramento, which could cost the industry hundreds of millions of dollars. And so beyond me driving in caravans, entrepreneurs up to Sacramento to talk to legislators for the first time about right. what blockchain is. And when we go, you're right, there's a lack of understanding. I ask them to rate themselves on a scale of one to five, each assembly member how well do you understand blockchain? And most of them come in at a one or a two. I've heard about Bitcoin. How can the people in this room start bridging that gap? How can they better communicate with policymakers like yourself about what needs to happen? Well, you're, you're doing a terrific job. And I would say don't think of yourself as lobbying. Think of yourself as uh, what can you do to contribute to the United States' as lead in technology and innovation? Uh, we have, in my view, we're going through a technology revolution in the world. And our challenge is how are our regulatory frameworks going to adapt to make sure citizens and consumers are protected? And how are we going to make sure that the opportunity of the technology revolution is distributed so the opportunities aren't just concentrated uh, in the Bay Area? And finally, how are we going to make sure that America leads this technology revolution and that it's not China or some other country? Uh, our success in leading the technology revolution, empowering individuals, will determine the success of the United States in the 21st century. And so we need your voice. We need your voice to help educate policymakers on what it is the United States needs to do to make sure we're leading in this industry. We need your help to understand how we prevent the bad actions, how we prevent the money laundering and the child pornography without stifling innovation. We need your help to understand how we protect investors and what we can do to define smart regulations and securities while still allowing companies to raise money and have new startups without fearing uh, illegal uh, jeopardy. Uh, this is a conversation that this country needs to have, and there's no way we can do it without people like you who are experts in that field. Uh, and I would just say every time you come to it with a policymaker, really think about it not from a sense of what's in it uh, for your, the industry or for your company, but what would you advise them the United States needs to do for our country to, to be a leader in this space and to have smart regulation? I really like that. I'm curious, what's one use case that you think could convince your fellow members of Congress that the utility of blockchain? I mean, for me, when I read about overseas voting on a closed-loop blockchain system for service members right. that are fighting for our country, I thought, wow, surely that's going to get everyone's attention. What's the killer use case we can start talking about? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a very good one. But I, I don't know if there's a, a silver lining, but there are many different, I think, use cases. I mean, I think people who care about the runaway health care costs uh, can talk about blockchain being used for electronic medical records and how uh, that can facilitate uh, the sharing of data while protecting privacy how it can also facilitate the use of artificial intelligence that requires large amounts of data uh, if you can uh, make sure that the data is uh, uh, protected but being able to be uh, moved across different systems. Uh, another use case is uh, 
uh, intellectual property protection and making sure that uh, blockchain may enable and help uh, protect uh, IP by uh, not allowing it to be abused uh, if you care about the protection of IP. Uh, another is, of course, supply chain management to see uh, how it, you can continue to improve complex global uh, supply chains. So there are uh, so many uh, different use cases, and I think that that's important. One important education, I think, for people is to realize that blockchain isn't just about financial transactions. It has uh, applications uh, more broadly uh, to so many different industries. Absolutely. I'd like to circle back to the Internet Bill of Rights that you're working on and the potential for adding a blockchain section for that. Can you tell us a little bit about the Internet Bill of Rights and why it's important to engage the blockchain community on this? Absolutely. The Internet Bill of Rights should have been passed 20 years ago. I mean, it talks about having a uh, responsible privacy framework for individuals on the Internet uh, and a responsible data framework. And so it says people should have the right to know what's happening to their data. People should have the right to... Uh, consent before their data is transferred or collected. Uh, people should have the right to, uh, to uh, understand uh, what companies are doing to monetize their data. And it calls for data anonymity uh, in terms of the processing of large parts of data. So you shouldn't just be able to uh, figure out the particulars of data if you want to drive patterns, but it should be anonymized before people are using that. I think it's important for blockchain advocates to uh, engage in the process because so much of blockchain is about protecting individual uh, privacy, protecting data, and not allowing the concentration of information in central systems, uh, and to understand what are those contributions that blockchain can make in terms of protecting privacy and data, and what are some of the other provisions that may be needed uh, basically to protect individuals online. And how should the blockchain industry offer up thoughts to you if they have ideas of what should be included in this? Should they just email you, call well, they your They should office? email me. They can email me at row at .com and I uh, check that. Uh, I don't reply to everything, but I read almost everything. And uh, they can uh, come to my office. They can come to other members of Congress's office. And even when I disagree, you know, I, uh, I'm always better educated uh, in an area that is going to be uh, so critical to, to our future. And that's really, I think, the, the main message I want to convey to folks here is that there is a huge knowledge gap in the Congress on issues of technology. Uh, a, a, I mean, I don't know how many of you saw the hearing where a member of Congress was yelling at Sundar Pichai, asking him how he could better regulate the iPhone, and Sundar Pichai had to patiently explain that Google doesn't make the iPhone that Apple does. Uh, and this is uh, the level of conversation that we're often having. And so when you look at blockchain, which is, you know, something new, which isn't just the Internet, then people say, well, you know, how do we know what, what this is going to do? Uh, and the idea that, 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 you know, that this is going to somehow displace uh, the U.S. dollar or something is the, 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 the fear mongering that people have uh, put out. Uh, as opposed to saying, look, this is just going to have greater innovation in an economy, even greater innovation in our own currency, possibly. Uh, and so I would urge you to really reach out to not just me, but to elected officials and say you just want to help educate them about this industry, its potential, places of abuse, places where we do need regulation, uh, places where uh, um, what America can do to lead in this industry. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Congressman. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you to everyone here.